living in a pretty amazing time where we're able to, uh, where technologies are emerging that can examine in real time the fundamental molecules that give rise to the complexity of life. Whether it's the machinery that synthesizes DNA or that translates or transcribes DNA and RNA, or translates RNA into protein, these fundamental processes can now be observed in real time and for low cost, so that we can now start scoring all of these sorts of traits, vast amounts of information at the individual level. And the low cost enables us to do this not just at the individual level, but in entire populations. And once we have this information, the promise, the hope, is that we're gonna be able to integrate all of that information generate models that can actually predict future states of the system, understand the complexity of these living systems so that we can know, for example, how to better diagnose and treat uh, diseases. And one of the technologies that I've been involved in uh, at Pacific Biosciences has the ability to resolve down to a single molecule of DNA polymerase in real time by confining it to a, to a tiny little nano well that's about 1,000th the width of, of one of your hairs, and observe it in real time as it's sequencing that DNA. And we're not constrained to just looking at a single uh, nano well, but we can look at hundreds of thousands of these nano wells at a, at, a, at a given time. And so watching hundreds of thousands of reactions going on, synthesizing DNA so that we can very rapidly sequence genomes and characterize their effects. And one of the applications uh, we had for this type of technology was, was highlighted in resolving the cholera outbreak strain. So you may remember this. Back in October, this uh, cholera strain wreaking havoc in Haiti. And there was a question about where this bug originated from. Did it originate from the waters of Haiti, or did it, was it carried there from afar? That has very significant public health uh, implications regarding vaccination strategies. So what we were able to do with this speedy technology was receive samples from, from our colleagues at Harvard who had collected these in, in Haiti, and in a single day, sequence that uh, cholera strain. And the next day, we sequence five other strains from different geographic regions around the world to compare to that uh, Haiti strain, analyze the data in a couple of more days, wrote a paper in a couple of more days. In three weeks after we received samples from Haiti, we had a paper accepted in the New England Journal of Medicine describing the origins of that strain. So it was a very intense process, made me feel like we were on a rocket ship, uh, you know, just the sheer speed of getting to that kind of discovery. And the, and the main result of that discovery was uh, unambiguously resolving the origin of that strain. What we showed was that strain was most similar in comparing it to all the seven pandemic strains. We showed that that particular strain in Haiti was originated from, uh, from a strain uh, in South Asia, not from the waters of uh, Latin America. So despite this, so the, so the path we're going to, to achieving this kind of understanding is, is uh, familiar in science. We start with data, generating this raw information from the high-speed sequencing instruments, and then we translate that into information by actually resolving what are the actual bases that are comprising that DNA sequence. And then we get to knowledge by assembling all of that information into, into a complete genome, and then ultimately to understanding, where we're comparing that genome to all the other strains to understand where it came from. So, but despite this type of success in understanding, we fail to achieve this level of understanding in most areas of biology, and in particular, human disease. And there's no better indication of that than this type of graph, where you look at the massive amount of money ramped up and spent in the pharmaceutical sector and in the government sector to better understand disease, and, and so we're accumulating lots of data, lots of information, lots of knowledge, but we're failing to translate that into understanding. And that can be seen from, from the other chart, which indicates the number of new uh, uh, FDA-approved uh, drugs to, to treat these diseases has actually gone down despite this massive spending and increase in knowledge. And I'm afraid that, that the failure to go from knowledge to understanding in this sense is, uh, is, is, is due to a fundamental flaw in the way we approach biology and the way we seek to understand biology. And I thought to uh, take you through that kind of flaw and what we can do to transform our thinking to enable understanding, I would give an analogy, a movie analogy. Like, uh, like complex organisms, living systems that are amazingly diverse, amazingly complex, 
Movies are also amazingly diverse and amazingly complex. And so what do we go through to understand a movie? And so to, to sort of get you uh, trained in the, in, the, in the right thinking, I'll show you this clip, a Nike ad, and think about all of the information being thrown at you at a single time and what your brain is doing to process all of that information to achieve understanding of this ad. You're seeing lots of different objects. You're recognizing different objects in different scenes, but you're able to not just recognize the objects, but put them together in sequence because you're being fed a stream of a rapid succession of frames over time that are telling you how these different objects are correlated with one another and what meaning is trying to be conveyed in the context in which they occur, right? So very nonlinear, but amazing amounts of uh, information that you're able to boil down in a, in, a, in a rapid sense to achieve understanding. Now think of what we do in biology uh, to, to achieve understanding. And I'm gonna give you a genetics example uh, uh, focused on Huntington's because uh, this Huntington's disease was a horrific disease popularized by uh, Woody Guthrie who died of this disease in 1967. And what we uh, were able to do with this disease is, is quickly identify what the gene uh, causing this uh, disease was because what we saw with people who had Huntington's disease is there was a very strong inheritance pattern in the families that carried this disease. In fact, that pattern was so strong it correlated nearly perfectly with changes in DNA around the Huntington's disease Locus, and so we were rapidly able to identify that gene. So we got to knowledge, right? We got to an understanding of the cause of the disease, but 30 years later, after that discovery, do we have understanding of that disease? We still don't know what the processes that are involved in causing that disease. We have no cure. We don't have any effective treatments. We haven't achieved understanding. And it's not hard to understand why we would fail to achieve understanding, because now I'm gonna take us to the movie analogy because genetics is simply giving you this gross aggregate, this gross average over a population. And you can no better understand the complexity of disease from that gross aggregate than you can understanding the clip that I showed from this image that I'm showing reflecting the clip. What this image is, is each pixel in each frame averaged over all the frames, averaged together so that you're seeing this gross aggregate of pixel intensities over all the frames presented as this image. And you can no better understand that clip by looking at this image than you can understanding the, the process of disease and how to treat and cure the disease from looking at single genetic effects. So the biologists will retort that this isn't so fair, that we don't just uh, use genetics to, to lock onto one gene, that we can understand the functioning of genes and how they relate to other genes. And that's, that's true, but the mind is doing it in a very simplistic, very linear fashion. And to show you why that's true, I'll lock onto another disease uh, that's treated with rosiglitazone, so type 2 diabetes. And here's the kind of story you're going to have presented to you in the scientific literature about how rosiglitazone treats a very complicated disease like type 2 diabetes. What's the effect of that drug? Well, we know the effect of the drug is to target P par gamma. So it activates PPAR gamma, and what I know when PPAR gamma gets activated are hundreds of genes change, even thousands of genes, depending on the context. Yet the story that's going to be told to you in the literature is that PPAR gamma is activated by, by rosiglitazone. It goes on to affect another gene, ABCA1. That goes on to affect uh, cholesterol regulation, and then on to stimulating insulin secretion to treat the type 2 diabetes. But this is no more of an understanding, given you don't understand the context in which any of this is occurring, than trying to understand the clip I showed you by now a little more sophisticated uh, method. You're not looking at a gross average. Here I've taken a single one-dimensional line through the frame, and what you're looking at in this plot are the pixel intensities through all of the subsequent frames. It's more information, right? You're, you're understanding more about how the scenes are changing, but you're not going to achieve understanding from that kind of view. And the reason is that there is no such thing as linear, simple linear pathways in biology. That all of these different variables that make up living systems are interconnected in very complex ways. The DNA, RNA, metabolites, proteins, they interact in highly nonlinear, uh, complex ways to form networks. And these networks don't act in isolation, but they're acting as a, as, a, as a system of networks of networks. And once we understand some of the fundamental characteristics of these networks, the biological processes that they define, we can start getting away from this single gene, simple linear view, and start understanding how these different networks are interacting with each other. Here showing you how changes in one network, say in a given cell or tissue type, can cause changes in another network in that same tissue or cell type. 
But we're more complicated than single cells or tissues, right? We're made up of lots of different organs. So the type of modeling we need to move towards is not only looking at how these networks are interacting within a given tissue, but how are they interacting between the different tissues. And from this sort of modeling, we're going to achieve uh, an increased level of understanding. And so the problem is going to be our minds are going to fight us every step of the way, right? Our minds are going to fight us because our minds are wired for storytelling, not statistical uncertainty. And we see this throughout human history, whether it's Zeus the sky god throwing down bolts of lightning when he's angry, whether it's the earth being the center of the universe, or whether it's the uh, earth being flat, or whether it's biological processes being driven by simple linearly ordered pathways, these are the kinds of simple stories we make up to explain complex things we don't really understand. And the way we're gonna fight this want to tell stories is through technological innovation and appropriate application of that innovation. So whether it's Galileo and the telescope resolving the mysteries of the universe, or whether it's cool new technologies like that from Pacific Biosciences to take ever deeper snapshots into these living systems to construct not only generate lots of information, but to appropriately integrate it to come up with models that can actually predict states of the system. So again, the aim is we're going to take all this information, we're going to integrate it in very mathematically sophisticated ways, and we're going to come up with models. We're going to depict these models as networks, but when you hear network, just think sophisticated mathematical model that's predictive. And this is the type of thing we're going we're gonna to do to get out of the linear uh, thinking mode. So the way we get there right, is we focus on populations, and those populations were scoring lots and lots of different uh, uh, variables, lots of different traits, from the molecular to the physiological to the imaging, scoring all of this, and then we're gonna integrate that and get to the networks. And one of the networks I had identified uh, for, uh, for type two diabetes is uh, depicted here. So this is a network that was highly predictive of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, again, generated by integrating lots of information over populations. In PPAR gamma, right, that the target of rosy glitazone happened to fall on this network. But look at this network. It's not, PPAR gamma is not interacting with a single gene like the literature is telling you ABCA1 to affect, uh, to affect type 2 diabetes response. It's interacting with lots of different genes, hundreds of different genes. That context is critically important if you want to achieve understanding in the action of that drug and the disease itself. So this takes us beyond that simple linear uh, uh, intensity plot that I was showing you earlier and gets us closer back to the movie analogy of seeing, you know, what's actually going on in this movie of life. It's not perfect, right? We're not going to be able to make out the entire understanding of this movie of life from this type of model uh, as a first instance. It's got to be iterated, it's got to be refined and, and validated, but this is the type of process that's going to get us beyond this gross aggregate average and into the actual dynamic, fluid, context-rich nature of, of uh, living systems. Given this type of information, we can now make more informed predictions about what to target to intervene in disease. So for example, here I'm showing you uh, one uh, snapshot, one blow up of the network highlighting PPM1L, novel phosphatase gene, uh, being pursued as a target for type 2 diabetes. And what does our modeling say? What is this predictive, more holistic model saying? It's saying that if we downregulate PPM1L, remember this is all done in silico, all driven by the computer. Red is your down, green is your up, and it says if we downregulate PPM1L, we're going to upregulate insulin, we're going to downregulate glucose, but we're also going to increase fat mass, and we're also going to affect genes that are involved in hypertension. So what the model is telling us is that we pursue this uh, as, a t as a target, we're going to treat your type 2 diabetes, but we're going to make you fatter, and we may increase your cardiovascular risk. Now we go in and actually experimentally validate that computer-driven prediction. And here's the validation. And just so now we go in and experimentally knock down this gene. And what we find, as highlighted in these graphs, is just as we predicted, the glucose uh, levels went down. But we also saw that the weight and fat mass went up. So the green curve are animals uh, who have the gene knocked down. They're getting heavier than the red curve, which are the animals, males, who have the wild type version of this gene. That weight difference is all due to fat mass. So they get fat just as we predicted, and the blood pressure increases just like we predicted as well. So this is not a drug that you would want to push. This is not a development strategy you would want to push because you don't want to treat somebody's type 2 diabetes by making them fatter and giving them a heart attack. That's not a very effective treatment. So what we can do is use the same type of modeling, though, to lock onto what are other nodes. Or before I go into that, I'll just say, again, PPM1L is next to PPAR gamma. That part of the network is showing these bad effects if you target it. This is something we knew two years before. All the information came out from the FDA from the clinical studies showing the marketed version of rosy glitazone of Andia 
increasing cardiovascular risk. This was information we could discern from the modeling without having to spend hundreds of millions of dollars or a billion dollars to actually get to this conclusion that it was going to have these bad effects. So again, this more holistic representation of information can get us to a more uh, a better level of understanding. And we can now leverage this network to lock onto genes that are going to have systematically good effects. So here's another node that comes out of our network. And what we can do in silico is we can tweak every one of the nodes in that network and understand what are the causal regulators of this network. What are the, what are the treatment intervention points that are going to have systematically good effect if we, if we intervene and twist that network into a more natural state? So here we have p 2 y 4 Again, our prediction is if you downregulate that gene, you're going to upregulate insulin, bring glucose down, lower LDL cholesterol levels, raise leptin levels, decrease fat mass, so systematically good effects. So based on the systematically good effects, we validated that experimentally, then went in and actually designed a drug to inhibit the activity of that, of that particular gene. And what you're looking at here are the graphs of that drug of animals on a high fat diet over a four week period of time. You're looking at percent weight gain over baseline. The red curve is on placebo. Uh, the, the blue curves are, are ranges of low dose to high dose of the drug. And on the high dose of the drug, you see the curve. The animals are completely resistant to diet-induced obesity. And actually below that pink curve, which, is, which are animals on a normally lean, healthy diet. So this seeming to say if you knock this gene down and you eat at McDonald's every single day, you're going to look better than your vegan friends if, if you have that gene knocked down. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, so just to wrap up, then we have, again, the main idea was removing our linear thinking, moving from the linear to the nonlinear. We started with DNA, showing how if you're just looking at that one dimension of data, you're not going to resolve an understanding of these complex diseases, because it's not DNA that directly causes disease. Instead, it's DNA causes effects at the molecular level. It changes transcription. It changes protein state. It changes metabolite levels. And those, those different variables, they're not acting in isolation. They're acting in the form of a network. And it's this network that's sensing genetic and environmental perturbations and causing the shifts in your system that lead to disease. And just to the final slide, look at how we think about, this is a complete paradigm shift of how we currently think about disease. And if you think about the pre-molecular biology revolution where we understood disease through physiology, what happened in the molecular biology revolution is we dismissed phy physiology as irrelevant because we were going to understand all of uh, biology by understanding the individual proteins that, that make up the system, right? So we ignored physiology. We're going to target single genes and have this amazing effect. But that strategy completely failed. It completely failed because diseases are not caused by single genes, but by, by constellations of genes, by networks of genes. And the way we're going to make molecular biology have an impact on clinical medicine is this more holistic view, looking at things more holistically and organizing all that molecular biology information in the forms of networks. And what those networks are going to do is tie the molecular biology to physiology, and through that we're going to achieve uh, impact on clinical medicine. Thank you.